Thank you so much, gentlemen. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. It's been a long day. And we still have one last session. Um, hopefully, we can take 30 minutes of your time. Kindly bear with us. So I would like to welcome on stage Rory. Um, he is the COO, the Chief Operations Officer at the Center for Affordable Housing Finance. Kindly welcome on stage. And he'll have two um, speakers joining him. One is Michael Canew, the CEO and founder of Natureville Homes. And we have Chris Colson, who is the CEO of Indigo Homes. The topic is mainly intervention on sharpening the affordable housing uh, government program. Welcome to the stage, gentlemen. If we could. Thanks very much, Program Director. Um, okay, so, and thanks for everybody who stayed. After we're done, you can go to the cocktails. Okay, um, the study that I'm about to present on behalf of CAF um, was commissioned by the World Bank last year. It's about almost six months old. Um, and um, I think the right place um, for, uh, to, well, part of the study was done by myself and somebody who's not here, Dana Kinya from University of Nairobi, and part of the study was done by CAF. The place I'd like to start is the affordable housing program, which pretty much is what Zoraba has just been talking about. What is it? Can we just pause and remind ourselves? It's one and a quarter million affordable housing units. That's the promise that's been made. That's quite a lot of houses. That's more houses than the uh, dawn of democracy Nelson Mandela promise in the Republic of South Africa in 1994, which was a million units in the same period of, of, of five years. What will it cost, the affordable housing program? 3.4 trillion Kenyan shillings. Depending on where the exchange rate is, it's somewhere between 24 and 24 billion, 24 and 27 billion um, US dollars. On an annual basis for Kenya, about 675 billion Kenyan shillings. Quite a lot of money. How much land will it need? Between eight and 9,000 acres of land. According to the NHC, um, it will produce, on their estimates of how many jobs it creates per house built, it has the potential, if it's successful, to produce three and a half million jobs based on the NHC estimates. The infrastructure that Zoraba has just spoken about and that came up in many times in the, in, earlier in the day, including in Alan's presentation, the infrastructure backlog, if the infrastructure is not going to be funded by the developer and passed on in the cost of the house to the buyer, how much money is needed to deal with the infrastructure ba uh, backlog? 2021 World Bank estimated that the infrastructure backlog in Kenya is going to cost somewhere around about 4 billion US. So that's also quite a lot of money. So if you're talking about the AHP, we're talking about a mega scale infrastructure project, infrastructure program. And if you're talking about a mega scale infrastructure program, we can't be talking about projects. Yes, the program is comprised of projects, but we need to be talking about an entire new system of the way that you run an assembly line to produce one and a quarter million housing units, affordable housing units, in the Kenyan economy over a period of five years. So, the first place that we'd need to start is with land, because 
Because without land, there isn't houses. So let's start with that. When the study was done in October, November last year, only 5% of the land that was needed for the AHP had been acquired. There was huge reliance placed, and still is huge reliance placed, on public land, which is almost all encumbered land. We all know that national government owns 57,000 units. There's a lot of more units in the counties. Um, these units are on land which is not very densely um, built up. And the AHP program mainly talks about that public land. But because it's encumbered land, and what I mean by encumbered land is, first of all, it's tenanted. Second of all, it's not surveyed. In fact, we don't know the acreage of the public owned land because it hasn't been um, proclaimed and it hasn't been surveyed. So the acreage is unknown. And thirdly, it has a lot of encroachments, illegal uh, land grabs, encroachments, infos, and so on. So it's encumbered land. And if it's encumbered land, as Pangani learned the hard way, it takes a number of years for it to be sanitized. It's a long lead time to get the land uh, available for the AHP. So there's a strong need to look be beyond this public land only for the AHP. Um, the discouragement to look at uh, private land because um, it's difficult to acquire needs to be looked beyond. It's also a, a, a very slow land registration process, the titling process and the move towards digitization. So what needs to happen? First of all, it is true that the public land uh, needs to be uh, seen as um, something that must be used because it's there and at the moment the public land is not an asset that's of value to Kenya because it's got a, if, if it wasn't, if the houses and the units on the public land were not deteriorating and what it cost to keep those units at the right level uh, of, of maintenance and so on, the cost to income ratio on that land is about two and a half to one. So it's not viable. It's pretty much the same kind of story, this public land, as council and public owned housing, which is an international story. So yes, it is very important. But if the public land is gonna be used for the AHP, it needs to be used in addition to acquiring private land, but there needs to be a program running in parallel, and these are, re are the recommendations in the report. First of all, there has to be a community-based program dealing with the seated tenants to, because there will be re relocations involved. Second of all, there would have to be a very expensive uh, acreage and surveying program. Thirdly, the adjudication of the encroachments and the problems would need to be resourced. It's not going to be a cheap process. And fourthly, there would need to be transparent procurement because one of the fears with the public land is that the public land will change hands um, through other means, procurement means, that are not all above board. So there needs to be a very strong land assembly program that goes to different spheres outside of only the public sector, to other institutional owners and even uh, individual owners. The Adri Sasa performance, which the previous panelists commented on how long it takes, the, the performance of the Adrisasa, for those of you who are not from Kenya, that is the whole automation of the land titling process, which is very much a manual process in Kenya. That would need to be properly performance managed and so that Kenya could reach a point where all the land ownership can be properly mapped so that uh, it's known who owns the land so a proper land procurement and assembly uh, program, program can be run. And then lastly, a reduced um, reliance only on public land. And then, can we have a look at infrastructure which has been uh, commented on by the pre previous group? So on infrastructure, uh, about 10 years ago, I'm not sure what the figure is now, and 10 years is a long time ago, but about 10 years ago, 22 US dollars was being spent per capita per year on infrastructure in Kenya. And the advice was given, don't forget, Kenya now has a, an urbanization rate of 4.1% per year. And it was advised then that if that investment in infrastructure was increased, it would pull through into what was then making a contribution to GDP of about 0.5%. And it was estimated that if proper investment in infrastructure took place, that would increase to about 3.5% contribution um, to infrastructure. 
to, to, to GDP by investing that. Now, the perception exists that no money exists for infrastructure, and that's why it's not being done. That actually is not true. And what the study saw is that, yes, there isn't enough money, but the problem is more that the money is fragmented and scattered through different agencies. Don't forget that infrastructure, non-investment in infrastructure, retards private sector, uh, private sector uh, investment. It's a known, it's well documented that if you want to um, uh, um, create private sector investment, the best way is to invest in public infrastructure and examples of ring roads if you were to change the form of your city. So what is needed on the infrastructure side? First of all, um, infrastructure directs private investment and urban for us, there, there, there needs in Kenya to be an urban infrastructure development program because of the fragmentation. And one of the ideas in the discussions with the PS that took, up, took place at the time is that uh, something like an infrastructure council would need to be established because it would not be possible to get all of the budgets that are fragmented through the different agencies to come through into infrastructure without uh, something, a council of adequate authority to create the coordination. Not to replace the agencies, but to create the coordination. And then the investment of between three and a half and four billion rand per year would need to take place. For that to be motivated, because it can't always all, all come from the public fiscus, but some of us, it would need to come from the public budget. And for that to be motivated, it would need to be seen not merely as competing with other needs on the budget, but more be seen as part of Kenya's growth strategy, because infrastructure investment creates growth. I just want to end on infrastructure by um, proposing a couple of things on how it gets funded. The first way that it gets funded is the land rents are not reaching infrastructure. And for those of you who are not Kenyan, um, I'm not talking about property rates. Property rates are paid, but the land rents are a different thing, because most of the titling in Kenya is through leasehold, and so in the urban areas especially, and, and uh, Kenyans who have a leasehold must pay land rent. And the original thinking behind a land rent was that the land rent would go into the pot, national fiscus, to fund infrastructure. But somehow with the budget deficit uh, or, or budget shortfalls, uh, that has been lost along the way. So the first source of the public portion would be the, should be the land rents or could be the land rents. The second is why would it all need to be paid for off balance sheet? Because the, the option of buyback PPP concessions is very applicable um, and, and, and straightforward, um, not straightforward, but on the strength of the revenue stream from infrastructure generated through the payment of services, uh, because there's a strong payment culture for services in Kenya, that could be done. Don't forget that um, uh, this kind of infrastructure is what you refer to as a quasi-public good. So it can also be blended financing, where some of the funding comes from the national budget uh, through taxpayers' money, and some of it comes from the PPP partner, which is effective deferred payment. Almost, it, PPPs are pretty much private sector partners giving the public sector a loan that is more affordable over a period of time, and it can come from that. And then the last source of funding this infrastructure would, of course, be the improved property rates, which is where infrastructure funding is supposed to come from. And then the counties would have a huge, a huge role to play in that. I would like to move now to, I think it's slide seven, and move on to the housing issue itself. So as far as the AHP product is concerned, which is described in the development framework guidelines, first of all on its uh, policy constraints. The first question is, uh, do enough people want to buy the units produced by AHP? The second question is, can enough um, target beneficiaries afford to buy the units offered through the AHP? And unfortunately, the answer to both of those questions so far in the Kenyan environment is no and no. So that's a policy constraint because the development framework guidelines make provision for this particular kind of product and this particular kind of program. So the first constraint policy-wise is that the DFG guidelines are not sufficiently segmented. They don't accommodate the mobility that the, was it IBUILD, I think, panel made reference to, 
where not everybody is, is wanting to buy this kind of product. There's no um, accommodation for rental housing in the, in the uh, development framework guidelines. And even though it's very high density, there's not much provision made for how the units must get managed post-development and how they must be maintained. The second one is the financial constraint. The financial constraint, 3.4 billion trillion, uh, 3.4 trillion Kenyan shillings, is the Bomayango contributions for the AHP um, uh, obtaining enough um, deposits by prospective buyers to be able to sustain that? The third, uh, when we looked at that last year, the total was 30,000 and it was trying to move towards 50,000, which is a, a long way short of the 1.25 million. The development cost versus sales cost, the development cost versus sales cost, the, the prices are moving very fast. Alan this morning said that the average per square meter cost of developing these units is about 71,000 Kenyan shillings. In the guidelines, the offtake price is 50,000. Two years ago, last year and, and the year before, it depended on what the, the tax rebate that was, that was available, but it was in the range of between 65, uh, 57 and 65,000 Kenyan, Kenyan shillings. So that is, of course, uh, a big price versus cost difference which can't be accommodated. If you look at how much people are paying in the rental units, though, This uh, machine is not great. Just have a look at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so at the bottom of the slide, some of the, some of the prices, are, I, I won't have time to read through them, but some of, the, some of the, the average household incomes in the first five segments identified in the rental housing survey are on the bottom there, and, and the prices that people are pay, paying for their rental units in the first five segments are given there. And to, to summarize, what people who are in the target market, because the first five segments of the rental housing survey overlap completely with the target market for AHP, and what people in, the, in those first five segments are paying for rental at the moment is between 9 and 12% of their average monthly income. So there's a price issue that uh, is currently um, a huge obstacle. There are also certain unintended con consequences of the way the AHP is currently designed. The first one is it's been mentioned many times at this conference. Almost 79% of Kenyans are renting. So if you look at the contribution of rental housing to the Kenyan uh, housing stock so far, it's... Uh, it's uh, over 10 years, it's been 1.6 million units. So it's pretty much outperforming what uh, is the actual performance on the ownership program uh, uh, at the moment. Secondly, the definition of what comprises um, scale. And this question probably is a very important one to ask with a lot of the presentations. At the current scale of the AHP, if you take, for example, the Park Road project, to get to 250,000 units per year, and just let this sink in, that means that every single year, using this policy uh, design, Kenya would need to produce 182 park road projects. So 182 units of a size of 1,370 units each. Another way to look at scale is that you can produce a lot of, you, of projects of 80 units each. You can produce 3,000 projects of 80 units each and arrive at the same result. Of course, the reality is that uh, it needs to be a mix of both. The other unintended consequence of the current design because of the price uh, cost mismatch is what you might call investor Raiding. So a lot of the units are being bought by investors and anyway ending up as rental units at the end of the day as opposed to ownership units because the owner doesn't reside in the unit. That's quite common. Um, and then that means that for, the, for government who's putting all of this money in, the subsidy is effectively lost. So what is, the, what is, the, what is possibly a solution to this problem? 
Um, well, for, for, for saving time, because I, I can't seem to, uh, I'm having the same problem as Zaraba. Um, the first solution to the problem is to spend some time on the question of defining uh, scale in the context of urban quality. There's a lot of books written about how urban quality is much improved um, uh, through diversity and through having um, uh, other land uses other than mass rental housing projects. The second thing is to broaden the suite of options and not to have a unidimensional not to have a unidimensional uh, affordable housing program. So in other words, to respond to the different segments in the market. One of the most important opportunities is possibly to respond to what you might call the organic or the homegrown uh, type of housing that's in any event occurring in Kenya. And a possibility is also to unlock, and I think it was, um, uh, one of the members of the panel this morning that mentioned this, that a mass rental housing program to unlock the, uh, the institutional investors and the pension funds. Of course, a lot of the developers say, but you won't make an equal return on a, on a rental model, but that can potentially be assisted um, through, uh, through the way that uh, uh, VAT on the construction cost is dealt with, because it's not currently zero rated, it's discounted, but it's not zero rated. So a program that has what's currently in AHP, which is high density ownership under sectional title, mass rental housing, equally high density, smaller rental housing, uh, even owner builder rental housing, the cooperatives, and of course, site and service. And there's a lot of work that can be done, and it's a question of whether uh, bringing in these other programs, especially the rental housing program, to legitimize them and to regulate them and to empower uh, those owners and ab enable them to acquire financing from the market is possible. A couple last points to rattle off on the housing side. Um, um, the, uh, by the way, the, la the, the last option on, on the smaller rental housing units would unlock uh, family capital. The next thing that would need to be dealt with is this, the, sectional, the, the sectional property scheme, because at the moment the sectional property scheme is new, it has teething problems, and even when the sectional title scheme is used in the large-scale projects, the, the titles take a long time to come through. There would need to be landlord and tenant legislation to regulate the relationships between landlords and tenants on the large-scale um, rental programs, but they would also need to be proper housing management arrangements because a levy would need to be charged on the high-density ownership projects. And don't forget about the rooming projects. I think Zoraba was the one also that mentioned that. We're talking about a 15 to 25 square meter unit, possibly with shared, shared facilities. Um, a strong, viable pipeline is also what will, is likely to bring the, the private capital in. The last place that, and there is a slide right at the beginning, but um, I'll, just, I'll just do it verbally. The last place is public sector reform. So some of the last presentations has touched on them. Ease of doing business issues, access to data issues, lack of automation issues, um, perceived duplication in trying to get approvals and especially planning approvals as well as titling approvals. So there are a number of, I think, quick wins that uh, the report recommended would alleviate that. The first one I've mentioned already, which is the Adrisasa rollout and project managing that so that it's time bound. The second one is to design for interagency coordination there's been talk of a one-stop shop. I'm not sure whether it's been established since, since last year. Um, the third is the amendment to the DFGs and the capacitation of the IPDU to be able to implement a more diverse, segmented housing strategy. The fourth is to run possibly with 
whatever the number of programs there are as the results, the housing, the products, but with the support enabling sub-programs like the land assembly program and the infrastructure program. Clarity on the role of county governments, because even if the PPPs are used and there's a buyback over time of the infrastructure that gets funded by the counties, ultimately the counties must own and maintain um, that infrastructure. And last is the role of government um, as an enabler to make all of this possible, because not all of this funding would need to come out of the national fiscus if, um, if, if, it, if it is able to take off. So, um, colleagues, Michael and Chris are the two panelists. I hope you haven't missed your meeting, uh, Chris. Unfortunately, there's no moderator, so, yeah. Um, and also questions can come from the floor, that's also a good idea, but let's just start maybe in the easy, difficult place. Um, permit approvals. Uh, by the way, Michael Kaniu, right? Correct. Um, is a developer, the CEO, founder, I think, of uh, Natureville, and Chris Coulson is also a developer from Indigo Homes. So you probably both know a lot about permits and the permitting that's required for your developments. What are your comments? Okay, so um, just, just to give you some background, uh, my name is Chris Colson, been here six years. I love this country. Before here, I was in Colombia. I was in Brazil before that. I was in Eastern Europe. Um, Colombia, um, I was there for five years. They built half a million affordable homes. So it can be done. Keep the faith. Although it is draining. Um, because in the six years I've been here, we haven't made a lot of progress. There's no new news. But anyway, let's be optimistic. Um, so currently, so I've been here six years. I was, we set up Mavida, Mavida Homes. There's a lot of branding that everyone's seen. Um, I left that two years ago and now work for Indigo Homes. Uh, we build beautiful townhouses in Ghana and uh, we're launching our first project in Kenya um, in about four months time. I, I really get up in the morning to do affordable housing and we're gonna come on to that. Um, because I believe it can be done, but it's going to be a huge slog because this presentation, the one before, wow, we've got a lot of challenges and a lot of roadblocks, which I'd hope would be start to be alleviated, but clearly not. Um, I, so the first project we did for Amavida, we were actually delayed by seven months in getting our final um, construction licenses. We were quite lucky at the time because we had two or three other projects so we could absorb some of our op costs. But if that was our only project, we would have lost about eight, eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand dollars, whilst waiting for that permit. So, you know, I, and I, I don't, I don't know if it's changed significantly. We're about to step through that process in about two months' time, uh, where we'll be applying for all our permits and everything else. Now, the site is not as contentious. It's not a high-rise. It's a low-rise building. So, I hope to get those within three to four months. But I think there's a lot of things that government can do to actually help facilitate. So, in Colombia, guess what? We got our approvals in 60 days. It's legislation. They have to respond. They work with and encourage developers to, to you know, go through the approval. And it's, approvals. it's very fastidious as well. It's very transparent. Um, so that's my experience. In Ghana, super simple. Very simple. 40 days. You put your application in. You pay your license fees, consultation, everything else. And you start building. Thank you. Good. I think mine is a bit uh, similar to that. Uh, what I've seen in Kenya is, depending on your scale and whether you're doing uh, apartments or low-rise uh, mansionettes, the time to get approvals varies greatly. So my first project, which is my MVP, it's called a mini minimum viable product, uh, was in Kajiado. I got my approvals in 30 days. I didn't know anybody. I just submitted to our townhouses and I got them. Come to Nairobi. Um, my projects took an average of one year for approvals. 
And the reason it took one year for approval is because I don't play ball. So those who are in Kenya know what that means. So it took me going and complaining to the city planner, why am I being frustrated? Uh, I've, my building is, is up to code. I've not overbuilt. My ratios are correct. So why am I being frustrated? And there's no reason. And from the goodness of her heart, I'll never forget that evening they were approved after being frustrated for a whole year with stories, comments. It's just a never ending process. But I think the worst part with all this approval process is occupation certificate. That is the biggest scam <laughs> in, in, in the county because they, the typical way Kenyans do this stuff is they finish the building, then people move in. So for you to move in, something has to happen. So they told us because we didn't play ball, we'll wait for you guys when you come for your occupation certificate. Uh, so, so we followed the book, we followed the process. Uh, they had put a note in our file that people have moved into the houses. So, because that's what Kenyans do. You finish a project, guys move in. And of course, we, we, we followed the process. And it took a long time to untangle that and bring separate officers to confirm nobody's there. Next question, where's your fire, 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 fire protection? Where is this, where is this? In fact, I put a post on LinkedIn. It, I, I counted, someone asked me, count me the number of steps to get all your approvals. I counted 30 permits, because I follow process. 30. Everything is a permit. Dumping, hoarding, occupation, fire, business, uh, NEMA, NCA. I put all that list, it's on, it's on, it's on LinkedIn. And there are 30 permits if you follow process. And that's why you see the way our industry is, because who has time to follow 30, 30, 30 processes? And they're all 30 different offices, and it's by design. So that's why our industry is the way it is. Thank you very much. As developers, as developers, you, you, you have to get your project financing lined up, and you need your clients to obtain their bonds to buy your units. A program, let's call it 24 billion US. Um, that's a lot of money for this program to find. If one and a, one and a quarter million units is, is, the, is the real target. What are your views on this? Uh, most commentary and most people we interviewed um, say that this is the thing that can't be fixed either because of availability of capital um, or investors not coming to the market, the pension and the banks not being having a big appetite, price. What are you, your views on the financing? <laughs> wow. Okay, so I, I think we need to be realistic here. I mean, building... 1.25 million homes in five years, I think is totally unrealistic. I think from my perspective, we currently build, my number is 10,000 homes a year. Someone this morning was 20,000, 30,000. We don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the construction companies to, to, to build that scale. We, we, we don't have that. So I would be happy if I'm sitting here in 12 months time and we have two or three developers here who are actually building affordable housing <laughs> in some kind of program and getting some tax concessions, you know, getting the corporation tax. I think it should be zero. Columbia was zero, uh, not 15%, and, and the VAT concessions and everything else. So I think 24 billion, you know, the government's got huge financial pressures, 1.3 trillion they need to raise over the next two months, and tax collections, keep the lights on. Um, so I, I, I don't expect, I, th I think we need to be realistic here, we really do. We need to get two or three projects on the go and we need the banks to come in. So in terms of, in terms of funding, to me it's so simple. And I said this six years ago, five years ago to Hinga and everyone else, just all the government needs to do two things and then it, it'll open this market. They need to give the developers proper tax concessions which is zero corporation tax and VAT concessions, nothing else. 
We don't want the land. We don't want, we don't want anything from the, anything else. That's all we ask for. And then the, what they need to do is, is talk to the high street banks and say to them, this is how much money I've got. Whatever the government can afford through this affordable housing tax, anything else, we're going to fund an affordable mortgage, right? We're going to give the high street banks the ability to offer uh, a homeowner mortgage at 8%, 8.5%, and the government will pay the spread on that. So they'll pay the 5 6% spread on that. That's it. It will work. Going forward, it will. That's what, if you look at all the other countries in the world, developing countries in the world that have successful affordable housing programs, uh, where the private sector has been able to come in and make a profit, not a big one, we're not greedy, well actually we are, but you know, a, a, a reasonable profit and we can build at scale. And scale for me is 25,000 units eventually over time. That's it. That's all they need to do. It's not complicated. And then yes, you've got all the other stuff about you know, the permits, the approvals, the, the occupancy certificates, and everything else. But at least start with the basics. If you get the basics right, then you'll get, there's some huge difference. So in, again, sorry, I keep saying this, but I was in Brazil. We had 30 tier one, maybe more, construction firms in Brazil that were building hundreds of thousands of units per year. Colombia, we had uh, a lot of American um, private equity going in, same as Brazil. Um, you had billions going into this housing, affordable housing um, development program. We can't get foreign investment in this program. Okay, I'm, I'm not aware of any foreign investors that would even consider looking at Africa to provide funding. Look at all the failed projects. <laughs> yeah? It, it's, so I think you've got to be realistic. We've got to like, just take a pinch of salt on this, and, 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 and that's all, that's all as, a, as a developer, and I know a lot of other developers who are of the same frame of mind, let's get the basics right. So then, Michael, another approach, if, if, if that is the case, there's a lot of money going into housing in Kenya, you drive around, the small big, there's a lot of units, there's a lot of people putting their own cash, family cash, business cash, into housing but it's nowhere in policy. So are these, I think some people refer to them as tenants, tenant, ten, tenements, are these an opportunity or are these a problem? Why is that not possibly the bedrock of a solution to the problem, seeing as it's local investment going in? So let me talk about some numbers. Uh, I, th I think the numbers are out there and they're clear. Kenya builds on average 50,000 homes a year. That's both by institutional uh, developers, your mom and pop, you're building your own home is 50,000. Out of those, only 1,000 of those homes actually for low income earners. So, so there's this big disparity of the homes that are being built, people are using their sacos, people are doing all sorts of stuff to build these homes with alternative financing models which are available. Uh, I personally don't feel the banking route is away because I've run the numbers. For you to make it affordable, you need to have concessionary rates of around 5%. I don't know what it was in Colombia, but if you're a 5% interest rate, there's no way you're gonna meet these numbers here unless you're building units and subsidizing them with other more expensive units. So it becomes very difficult to have a clear exit uh, as, as a developer. On, on the part of getting these homes ready, so the numbers that we have of projects that have been kicked off so far with affordable housing to date, is around 30 to 40,000 units. So we are to see how that completion, there's one thing to, everyone's a developer here, there's one thing to break ground, and there's one thing to execute that project, because executing is very difficult in this market. To your point, I think what we need in Kenya is make it easy for us to build. Just make it easy for us and give us alternative funding, whether it's from capital markets, et cetera, and private sector will build those homes. But at the moment, it's so difficult. I'm actually surprised to hear Kavit is saying he makes 500K a house. <laughs> I can't do that. It's just, it's just too small because the risks of the cost, the inflation can wipe you out just like that. So I think make it easy for us. Remove all these barriers that are there. Let's get the one-stop shop where I drop all my drawings. I get all my 30 permits in one go. There's revenue for the government. 
I'm, I'm compliant. When guys come to site, they're trying to shake you down. And we will build the house as a private sector. Just make it easy for us. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, program director signaled that we must end. She's, she wants Thank her you. cocktail. Goodbye. She wants it. Any final word from you, Chris? Any final word from you, Michael? Is there a question? Yeah. Oh, is there a question? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I've just been listening to you guys about uh, the mess that we have in county governments. And um, I sit here, I sit on, I've been on both sides. I am a developer, but I've also been a governor. And I can tell you guys, I mean, we, we, we can continue complaining about this thing. And I liked what the chairman, I saw the saying, speak about it. I think we must find a way of legislating this approval process in this country. And, and I think the Kenya Developer Association can help us. We must find a way of getting parliament to legislate. I mean, Mike, I, I, I was listening to you. It took you one year to get approvals in Nairobi here. I mean, that's something that we should not allow to happen. And I would like us to find a way of engaging the government, the policymakers, so that we can get this thing legislated so that we can have what he was talking about. If it's two months, it must be in law that if you submit your approval uh, to count government within one month or within two months, it must be approved. And it can be done. So let's find a way of engaging uh, government on it. Let, let me answer that. One thing that I've done because of that experience, I'm in public policy advocacy. So I'm no longer on the sidelines. I'm like, this should not be happening. Yeah, it should not. So one thing that I... I am part, I'm, part, I'm a sector board member at CAPSA, and they have nominated me to be in the affordable housing program technical working group to solve these issues. Because it's difficult for investor. If, in fact, I, I got an investor twice in the last two years, and they got tired of titling, and they said, you know what, this is too much. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I'm not interested in going through this process that, that you have in Kenya, because it's too difficult. So I'm not on the, on the sidelines anymore. I'm at the seat and I'm representing Brilliant. the private sector, so we fix these issues. Um, look, we've got to we've got to be pragmatic, yeah. I mean, you know, we have such a huge housing shortage here, um, and I think everyone's got ideas around how to how to solve it. What what I do is, you know, I don't reinvent the wheel. And any of my look, just go and look at other countries. Look how they've done it. The problem we've got now, though, is that. The government do need an element of funding to make this happen. So the easiest one is, I've already mentioned, the tax concessions and everything else. But look at the infrastructure in this city. I mean, you know, I used to manage Garden City. You know, we had to fix some of the main infrastructure on, on, on the highway, you know, because it, was, it had fallen in. I mean, there was literally, you know, it was, it was dangerous. Um, I... I, I I've heard so much today, so many negative points today. Um, and, you know, we need the government to, to actually step up. We do. You know, there's, there's an obligation there. Um, and, and there's a commitment to build whatever, whatever the number is, you know. But start. Now, there's 40,000 units going to be built, right? We all know that probably half of those will never finish. Yeah, and the half that do finish, who, who gets those? You know, there's a lot of gray area here, um, and 
it's not for us to decide. It really isn't. We try and push, and this guy here is fantastic. He's, he's putting time in to try and make those changes happen. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the government program today is fundamentally flawed in the pricing. Just one element, the pricing, okay? I use pension money, right? I use American pension money. That, so my investors give me their, their cash, the endowment, the university endowments, anything else, and I've got to give them a 20, 22% return, okay? It's, I, it, that's what they want. They, they, they get a lot lower um, because they're mandated to invest in, in countries like Africa. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's so challenging already, you know, being able to achieve those returns. If the government pricing is at 500, is it 50,000 a square to sell, my bill cost, right, is 80. I'm not that good at maths, but, you know, that's not a deal I'm going to do, yeah? So how do we do it? Because we can't sell at 80. I can't sell that. It's too expensive. 5% mortgage. That works. I'm saying 8% because I'm, I'm saying... 5% of the banks and then the 3% spread. We actually had a foundation out of the US who were going to give us $10 million to fund 200 homes, 5% mortgage in Ghana. It's 200 units, right? But it's a start. We need billions and billions of, of foreign investment. And, I, I, you know, you've got to be realistic. You said 74 billion or whatever your number was. It's not going to happen. We've got a war going on in Ukraine. We've got a lot of other stuff going against us. Um, so I think, you know, we've, we've got to, we can't give up. But, you know, the, the, the government really has to, I think, they've got to consult with the private sector. So in Colombia, sorry again about Colombia, there was a 12-month consultation period before they announced anything. Here it's two weeks at best. Thanks, Chris. Are we wrapping? Oh, Casey. Maybe I'm not the only one. Very quick comment. I just want to reiterate because the issues that you've raised and the numbers that you've raised, and Zoravar, the numbers that you raised, that's what we need to be collecting. We need to collect it so we can show it to the investors so they can see whether, you know, how, how, there are risks, we know that part we know, but what are they large, medium, or small? To what, to what particular area can you attract different, different investor appetites go to different kinds of risks? We have to be able to communicate that. Um, we have to be able to communicate to the government what is the cost of not doing the things, right? The point that you made, Zoravar, that it's not just the cost of offering the incentive, but if you don't offer the incentive and then the development can't happen, A, you don't meet your targets, but B, all the impact on economic growth and on job creation and on all of those other things. And what happens if um, the other person from Tbilisi spoke about six weeks for an occupancy certificate? Well, what actually does that cost? Because we hear those as anecdotal stories. I'm gonna look at your LinkedIn profile and look at the list of 30. But specifically, and this is within that open access initiative that Alan spoke about earlier, and we're serious about this. We want to create a, a, a structured mechanism for collecting this data so that we can then repeat and we can say that it took this developer this long and this developer this long and this developer this long and we can show that it's not an anecdote but it's actually the experience. Um, so I've, I mean, I'm quite excited by the discussion. I'm so happy that you've got so many different developers that are participating in your initiative and that's like classic action research, right? You're making it happen while you're writing down how hard it was. But so is the development process. And if we could turn actual developments into action research, because your experiences are what we need to write down and share. Um, so we would really, really welcome your insights and what is the best framework for that data collection? What are the indicators that you can very easily collect on a regular basis that we can then also shout out 
whether publicly or privately, and as Alan said, within the framework to, to protect the, the competitive process, not undermine it, um, so that we can address these things, because we have to get past anecdotes. Thanks, Kasia. Max, I think you've got the final question. Let, let me take that one. Um, my first project, which was I think uh, seven, eight years ago, I sold all of it through mortgage. I sold all of it through mortgage. Fast track eight years later to register that lease or is impossible. Until now, three years, I've given keys, people have earned rent for two years. I can't give them a title or a lease or anything, because the process is just cumbersome. And let's be real about this. I don't know if you noticed something when, when they launched the Mukuru project. The former CS of, of is it transport was thanking the new president that the government was able to get their own title. They could not get their own title for two years plus. They were thanking the president that the president was able to get them their own title, that they could not get as government. So if the government can't get their own title, who are we to get our own titles? <laughs> and that's just the, 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 the fast, I've been in tech for long, the way the, the, the thought process of this has wasn't really thought through. Uh, it was painful, it's the fourth time you're trying to do it. But once that is solved, it will be like, I think we'll forget how getting an ID was difficult, getting a passport. Hopefully, we'll be able to get our titles from the comfort of our desk. It's painful now, but I feel we are at the end, because I have some details, we are almost at the end in unlocking at the Sasa. Once that's done, we'll go back to the good old days. Mortgage, oh, same price as cash price, come on. But for now, I can't take, I have mortgage customers, they have not paid me, what am I supposed to do? I think if, if, the, banks, if the banks do construction link payments, then we're, 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 we'll reduce the premium. The reason why there's a premium of 15 to 20 percent, some do 25 percent, is because cost of capital. We're actually building the house with our own cash. They put a 30 percent deposit on, which gets you out of the ground, and then the rest we have to fund, and we don't like doing that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michael. Um, that brings the session to an end. Can I hand back to you, Program Director? Thank you so much. I know that both of you were called upon at the very last second. Thanks, Sita, for doing that. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It was a good session, and we've come to the end of our forum. You can all breathe out. Um, thank you so much for your time and sacrifice sitting here. Thank you so much for your contribution. And if anything, just go out remembering that I'm proud of you for staying with us to the end. I hope the conversations have been insightful and we all aim to take, a, take action in our different capabilities and capacities. Just to finalize, just give me two minutes to finalize and echo two things. One is on data. The other is on two associations that we need. We need to work towards joining. We are stronger together. So the AUHF and the KPDA. Kindly, if you could just add your voice to that so we are able to advocate for better services, streamline processes, and work together. A special thanks to the AUHF and EAPI for this forum. Uh, thank you all speakers and contributors to the sessions, to the entire audience for your comments, your questions, and overall contribution. Thank you so much. You've all earned an invite to the cocktails. They're going to be upstairs Mount Elgon Terrace, exact same place we had, we had lunch. We only have cocktails today, so please take advantage of that chance to network. Have a good day and thank you so much.